Hello and welcome. It's time to put the finishing touches on our app. We're going to incorporate sound effects into our app. We're going to randomize the cards so that the pairs don't appear right beside each other in our grid. And furthermore, we're going to add some logic so that each pair of cards can only appear once in our set of 16 cards. All right, so let's get going. So the first thing I want you to do is download the zip file below the video which contains all of the sound files that we're going to use in the project. And once you unzip it, you're going to get this folder called sounds. So open it up and actually before we drag it into our project, why don't we go here in the file navigator and go create a new group called sounds. And that's where we're going to place all of our sounds. So double click the sounds folder on your desktop or wherever you unzipped all of the WAV files and I'm just going to select all of them and drag them into my group right there. Now it's going to pop up this dialog menu and I want you to make sure that copy items if needed is enabled and this is going to make a copy of the sound files inside your project folder and not just um, have it refer to wherever those files are on your computer. And so this way it keeps all of the files nice and tidy with the project. And add to targets match app should also be enabled. If this is not enabled, your sounds won't be included in your app bundle, which is that little neat package um, that represents your app and all of its resources. And that bundle gets installed onto the device. So you want to make sure that these sounds get included inside that app bundle like that. Now click finish. And here you can see all of the sounds. When you uh, highlight one of them, you should be able to play and hear it. So this is when they get the match wrong and this is initially when the cards get laid out. So those are my sounds there. The next thing you wanna do is click on this project node. We're going to have to add an extra framework in order to get the classes um, that we can use for audio. The reason it's in a separate framework is because not all apps need this audio capability and so that code isn't automatically bundled by default. So if we need that stuff, we can just simply add it. Under this general tab here, uh, if you scroll down to linked frameworks and libraries, you can click this little plus icon and then I want you to search for AV that should filter the list enough that you can find AV foundation framework. So go ahead, highlight and add that. And there you go. You should see that. And next, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new class and this is going to be a sound manager class. This is where we're going to keep all of our audio code. The reason why I'm not including it in the view controller, and I actually could do that, but to be honest, I don't want it to get that messy in the view controller. It's better to abstract these things out and having a separate sound manager class that contains all of the audio code allows us to use that class for various view controllers. If this were a bigger project and it also gives us one place to look at to troubleshoot any audio related issues. So we're going to go ahead um, and create a new class by choosing new file and it's going to be a swift file not a coco touch class because i don't need to subclass anything so i'm just going to choose swift file click next and i'm going to save as sound manager click create and by default it's imported foundation we also want to import av foundation which is the framework we just added because by importing this framework, it's going to allow us to use the classes inside that framework. So let's declare a new class called sound manager, just like that. And the class we are using is called the, uh, let me just create this property, is called the AV audio player. Let's create it as an optional because we are going to uh, create the actual object later on. Now this sound manager class is going to have a function or a method rather uh, called play sound and we're going to pass in the sound which we want the sound manager to play. You can see here that we ha do have four different sounds but instead of passing in let's say the name of the sound file I'm going to do something cool and something that you've seen before actually. So let me just go into the view controller and show you 
an example of what we're going to do. So for example, up here, when we did the run loop statement in the previous lesson, for mode, you can see here that we just put in dot and then we chose common modes. Well, what's happening right there? Uh, let me let me just actually show you again. So run loop dot main dot add, whoops, different add. We wanted this one. So in the first parameter, we specify a timer, but in the second parameter, that's where I want to draw your attention to. And we have to specify something called a run loop mode option. You can see up here we specified common modes, but what this actually is, is an enumeration. You can think of it as a set of predefined values, and it's very useful to allow the user to pick from one of a set of options. In this case, if I show you, if I hit dot like this, or maybe the autocomplete is not going to cooperate with us, but if I type in run loop mode dot, you can see these guys here um, are the values that I can choose um, for my run loop mode choice. And that is what we want to do with our sound manager as well, because we only have four different options. So I want the user to pick from one of these four um, without having to really know about uh, the file names and stuff like that. So if we go back to the sound manager, let me show you how to create an enumeration. Um, we're going to create it up here. You use the keyword enum and you give your enumeration a, uh, a name. In the case that I just showed you, it was run loop mode. We are going to call it sound effect. So you open up a set of curly brackets and inside you put all of the cases that it can be. So for example, we have the we have the flip sound effect. And actually we want to use lowercase here just to follow the naming convention um, that Apple has proposed. So we have shuffle as well. We have uh, it's a match and we have no match, which is that ding sound. We have ding wrong, ding correct, card flip, and shuffle. Okay, so when someone calls play sound, they're going to have to specify a sound effect. And we're going to um, do that. Okay, so inside play sound, we are going to create a variable called uh, sound file name is equal to an empty string. And now depending on, you know, which case or which enumeration value they put in, we can specify the appropriate sound file name to pass into our audio player. So we can use a switch statement and you can press enter for it to um, kind of come auto complete for you. We're going to switch on the effect. So you can actually put that as the value. And for the case, we are going to say, you know, if this is a case of flip, then sound file name whoops sound file name is going to be card flip we don't have to specify a uh, wave let me just add some line breaks here so it's a little easier to read we have case dot shuffle in this case sound file name is going to be shuffle we have case uh, whoops case is match in that case, sound file is ding correct. And we have case is no match. In this case, the sound file name is ding wrong. Now, if it's default, if it's none of those options, then we'll just leave sound file name as an empty string. Now, it shouldn't be that way because uh, I guess I missed these colons here uh, because we are specifying an enumeration it should be one of these four values here okay so in terms of indentation I kind of like to indent it like this but I'm curious to see what the default indentation is actually so uh, what we can do is actually go into editor if we go into structure we can re-indent everything let's highlight everything first structure 
re-indent everything and that's going to properly indent everything for us. So I guess by default it likes to line up the case with the switch so we can leave it like that. Default will never be executed. It, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> now I wonder if it'll let me remove it because I think with switch statements you actually do need a default case. Maybe not if you're switching on an enumeration because that's only from a set of known values like I said. All right, that's great. So let's add some comments around here. So uh, determine which sound effect we want to play and choose the and set the appropriate file name. All right, now we get into actually specifying the URL of the sound file. Remember when I told you that when you added these sound files to make sure that under membership that it was enabled for the match app. Well, what it does is when you compile your app and it gets put on an actual device, those sound files get included in the app bundle. Now, what we need to do in order to play that sound is we need to find the path to that sound file in that app bundle. We need to specify that. So if we go back to the sound manager, there is a way to determine that and you can actually access the bundle and we want the main bundle and we want the path for resource of type. This is the one you want. Path for resource of type. Returns the full path name for the resource identified by the specified name and file extension. Okay, so we're going to choose that one. The resource is the sound file name and the type is going to be wave. Make sure that this matches exactly these file extensions here. If it's MB3, you would put MB3. So this returns the path. Let's put it into a constant. Let's call this bundle path. And this returns an optional string. It could be nil because if it can't find the sound file in the bundle, it's going to return nil. And if it returns nil, we're kind of dead in the water. We can't really do anything about that. Um, there must be something wrong. You might have specified a typo or something like that. So we're just going to put a guard statement here. Guard, guard bundle path is not equal to nil. Else, if it is nil, then we have no choice to return. And we can actually just print out um, couldn't find sound file. sound file name in the bundle. So if this is the case for you, I would make sure that these WAV files are included in this target as well, that you're specifying these file names that match directly with the file names here and that the extension also matches. Okay, so here, get the path to the sound file inside the bundle. Next, we have to create a URL object from this string path. And the reason we have to do that is because the AV audio player that actually plays the sound, it needs a URL object. And I know this because I've used it before and you are about to find out. I'm just saving you that trouble here. So let sound URL equals a URL object. You can see there's actually a class called URL and there are a whole bunch of different initialization uh, methods that we can use. So what we would want is this one URL um, file URL with path. And then we would pass in the bundle path like that. And I'm going to actually force unwrap that optional because uh, we do have this guard statement. So if it comes here, I do know that a bundle path isn't nil. Okay, after all of those steps, we can finally create our audio player. Create audio player object. So remember up here, we have a property called audio player for it. 
So that's what I'm going to assign our object into. Uh, let's create a new AV audio player. And we are going to use this one. We're going to initialize it to contents of. And you can see here that we specify a URL object to pass in. And we do have that here sound URL. That's what we're going to pass in. But notice this keyword here throws. This keyword basically means that when you try to create this AV audio player, if it can't find that sound file for any reason at that URL, it's going to throw an error. So you actually have to handle that um, using this special do try or do catch statement, which I'm going to show you in just a second. Um, so just pay attention to any method calls or initialization methods that you use that have this keyword throws in it. And actually, even if you forget, it's okay because Xcode is going to warn you if you forget to handle this error. So uh, we have to be careful of that. So we're going to pass in the sound URL and let us just, yeah, I don't even have to build it. Xcode has seen the error. Call can throw, but is not marked with try and the error is not handled. Okay, so this first part marked with try is you have to put this keyword called try in front of that method or initialization method which throws an error and then what you have to do is you have to wrap that statement or group of statements inside a do catch block so it's almost like an if statement let's indent this And so you can see the Xcode error has gone. Let me just explain what's happening here. So like I said, this statement throws an error if it can't create the AV audio player object. And since it throws an error, you have to specify this keyword in front of it called try. So if you read it like plain English, you're going to try to create an AV audio player object. If it fails, it's going to come down into here, this catch block of code here. So you can, what will usually happen is uh, couldn't create audio player object, maybe log the error or something like that. So print couldn't create the audio player object for sound file. And you can specify that sound file a sound file name like that just so you can troubleshoot what's wrong with that particular sound file and down here you can finally if all else is going smoothly you can finally call the play function on the audio player to play the sound okay and that is it for our sound manager play the sound error. Okay, so let's review what we've done here. So we have an audio player property, we have a sound effect enumeration, which lets us specify one of four values because we only have four sounds. This play sound function is going to accept an sound effect enumeration value. It's going to determine the file name of the sound to use based on what value is passed in. And then we go about getting a path to that sound file and then creating the audio player and finally playing the sound. So now let's move back to the view controller and use our sound manager. We're gonna scroll up here into the property section. Let's create a sound manager. We're gonna instantiate this property to a new sound manager object. And then we're gonna play the shuffle sound at the start. And we're gonna to want to do that in the did uh, view did appear. We're gonna override this. this. This method gets called when the view is presented to the user. So from here, we can call sound manager dot play sound, and you can go ahead and hit dot and choose shuffle. So now let's run our app and just listen to see if that sound gets played. Okay, so you can see that that sound is played there. Um, there are a couple of different places that we want to also add our sound. So for example, when 
the collection view did select item. When the card flips, all right, we can also play the sound here. Play sound dot flip. So you can hear that. Now let's integrate the sounds for the match or not match. So here when it's a match, play sound, sound manager dot play sound dot match. And if it's not a match, we also want to play sound. Okay, so let's run the project again. All right, so all of our sounds are playing, that's great. There is one more thing I wanna show you, and that is that there isn't really a reason for us to have to create a sound manager object, because all we're doing is calling that play sound function, and the object never needs to retain any values across different calls. So there really isn't a point for us to have to create a sound manager object. Instead, we can do something like this, where you can see this timer is a class and this scheduled timer is actually a type method of that class. So we don't have to create a timer object in order to call this uh, method here. So let me show you what we can do. So go ahead and erase this statement like that. You're going to get a bunch of errors, but ignore them for now. In sound manager, what we want to do is simply add the keyword static in front of this function play sound. And we're going to have to add static in front of this property as well, because um, this property is used inside uh, play sound, which is also a static method. So you're going to have to uh, make sure that the variables used inside or properties used inside are also static. What this does is it allows us back in view controller, scroll down to the view that appear it allows us to this should actually be an error it allows us to call play sound like this so we can call the class sound manager dot play sound like that see so we don't actually have to create a sound manager object and call that objects play sound method because play sound this is actually a type method of the sound manager class now, or it's a class method. In other programming languages, it might be known as a class a method instead of a type method, but in Swift, it's called a type method. So let's go down to the other places uh, check for matches. We're going to call it on the class itself now. Call it on the class. Where is the last place? There's one more error. There it is, flip. Okay, now let's run the project and make sure that all of our sounds are still playing. So there's actually two more things to do before we can end off our match app, and that is in the card model, we have to randomize the array of cards and also to make it so that we only have unique pairs of cards. So let's actually tackle this guy first because it's easier to check before we randomize the cards. And the way we're going to uh, accomplish this is we're just going to keep an array of all of the generated numbers that we have accepted or that we've already generated. And before we, you know, create new cards, we're just going to double check that the random number generated up here isn't one that we have already generated. So let me show you how that works. So up here in this function of get cards, we're going to declare an array to store numbers we've already generated. I'm going to call this the generated numbers 
array and it is just going to be an integer array it's going to be empty initially right and right here inside this for loop we're doing it uh, eight times and we are generating a random number each time now before we go ahead and do all of this stuff which is creating the two cards setting the image names and then adding them to the generated cards array before we do any of that we need to check that this random number isn't one that we already have so the way we do that is we're just going to say if generated numbers array contains and this returns a boolean whether or not um, the array contains the element in question so we're going to put in random number if this is equal to false that's when we want to do all of this stuff right so let's cut all of this stuff and put it into here all right so we're only going to do this code if the random number um, if the random number isn't one that we already have inside a generated numbers array uh, cannot convert value of okay so we're going to cast this as an int okay so uh, sorry you gotta do that okay so if it is a number we don't have yet then we want to log the number print the random number but as well store the number into the generated numbers array so that next time we check you know this number is already used up so we can append new element we can append the random number and this is gonna we're gonna have to cast that as an int again all right so that's basically it there's one more thing we have to do actually ensure that the random number isn't one we already have okay so we need to change this loop um, because this only runs eight times and in eight iterations of this loop we can't guarantee that we will generate eight unique random numbers so instead we need to use a while loop and run for as many times as we need until generated numbers array reaches the count of eight. So we are going to say while generated numbers array dot count is less than um, less than or equal to no less than eight because once it reaches eight we don't want to run it again. So this should make sure that all of the cards are random. So um, in the view controller let us give ourselves a little more time let's say 30 seconds and let's run the app and well actually we don't even need to do that because we are printing the numbers so you can see here four thirteen eight two six five one three let's run that again hmm it didn't print anything that time what happened there Okay, nine seven one eight eleven twelve six four. I'm pretty satisfied that these numbers are unique. Eleven ten two nine one thirteen six seven. Okay, now it's time to mix them up. Okay, let's mix them up. So, in the card model, in here for randomizing the arrays. So the cards we have to randomize are inside this generated cards array. It's an array of card objects. So you might be tempted to do something like this, where let's say you wanted to swap the first two cards, zero and one. So you might be tempted to do something like, so this isn't actually going to work like you think it will, because what you're doing here in the first line is you are making index zero equal to index one. So after this line executes, both zero and one are equal 
in terms of the card that they point to. So this line does nothing because zero and one point to the same card anyways. What you wanna do before executing this line where you're essentially going to lose the card that slot zero was pointing to by assigning it this, you wanna preserve that card first. So you're gonna say let temporary storage, let's hold on to the card at index zero. All right, we're gonna store that card at zero into temporary storage. And then we are going to overwrite index zero with whatever card index one is. And then lastly, in order to complete the swap, we assign into spot one, the card that we stored, uh, we put into temporary storage, right? It was originally the card at zero. So now you have the completed swap. You have the card at slot one in slot zero, and you have the card at slot zero now in slot one. So that is swapping two cards. Now we have to do it randomly, right? So instead of swapping zero and one, why don't we swap zero and a random number? So we're gonna do let random number equal to arc for random uniform. And we're gonna say the upper bound is generated cards array dot count. And this is actually going to throw an error because the expected argument type is, let me see if I can expand it here, uh, is uint32. And actually we can just click fix and it's going to convert that count to a uint32, which is what it needs. Uh, and then we are going to pass in random number instead of one. The funny thing is we probably have to cast this as an int now. See, you cannot use a subscript with an index of un32. Okay, so what we can do is just cast the result of this random number to an integer. So at this point, these three lines of code is swapping the card at spot zero with a random spot. So that's just one swap. In order to randomize it some more, we are going to go through all the indexes in the array, starting from zero, and we're gonna choose a random number and perform the swap. So that's how this is going to work. So we're gonna say for uh, let's say I in zero to generated cards array dot count. Oops, I don't want to cut that next. And then we are going to indent all of this. And instead of zero, we're going to put in I. So at the end of the day, you should have code that looks like this. Right, this is the swapping code. Swap the two cards. Find a random index to swap with. And this should return our randomized array. So let's test if this works. Oh, index out of range. So I probably have to do minus one. All right, so let's see if these are randomized. These two look the same. Oh, one's a closed box and one's an open box. So this looks pretty randomized to me. And I'm gonna leave it up to you in terms of how long you should let the user try to match all the cards. And with that, our Match app is done. Congratulations, you've completed the Match app. You've learned quite a bit in this module, including how to use the MVC design pattern, how to use custom classes, how to use collection views, delegates and protocols. You learned how to use the Xcode debugging tools to troubleshoot your project. You also learned best practices in terms of organizing your project and naming all of your variables, classes, and methods. You also learned how to show alerts and how to use timers. 
And best of all, you learned all of these things while building a tangible app. You're making amazing progress and there's a lot more exciting things to learn, so let's move forward. I'll see you in the next module.